All right, we've had the go. It's time to go. There's 260 of us sitting around this table today. So kia ora koutou katoa. Ngā mihi kia koutou. Tēnā rā koutou katoa. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge all the First Nations, Indigenous and people from country who are here today and are uh, looking at um, our korero for treaty-based futures and anti-racism. If you're not here for that, you can go somewhere else. Today, we're going to be talking about Awatere Huata, about revisiting Māori sovereignty. I'd like to acknowledge uh, our partners who are many and varied, and we really appreciate the support from them. Over the coming days, you'll see amazing lineup from all over the world. I don't think there's a continent that isn't represented. So kia ora. Uh, ko waio, ko Nick Coop tōku ingoa. Uh, Takatimu te waka auraki te waka, waka waitaki te awa, ko kaitahu rato ko te ati awa ngati tō ngati ngari rangi tāne. I have the absolute pleasure and exciting job of uh, introducing Donna, who is from Ngati Whakaui, Ngati Parau, Ngati Hini and Ngāpohi. So not afraid to speak up, and apparently that started at the age of 14, at, where she started the gender pay gap negotiations, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> a founding member of Ngā Tamatoa, um, who helped us set our way around to Titi of Waitangi, and wrote the amazing book, Māori Sovereignty, in 1981. And I really look forward to our chat today, Donna. Kia mm. kwe, Hilda. I kia ora tātou everyone. I kia ora Nick. Uh, <clears throat> so, and greetings to everyone and welcome. So just before I start, I just want to say to Heather, who invited me to do this um, talk, uh, how hard it was for me to get a copy of Māori Sovereignty. I've got one. I mean, it's here. We only ever printed 3,000 copies, so they're pretty rare. Um, and this one that I, I got at the last minute, was stolen, someone pinched it from a library, but you know, there's hardly any copies left. And when I went online to try and find one, there's a rather tatty um, PDF that someone's put up and that, and I was actually relying on that. So one of the good outcomes of today, Heather, um, is going to be that I'm actually going to get it done into a, an ebook so that uh, people can actually read it. I read it um, yesterday for the first time in many, many years, I actually can't, I can't, I don't think I've actually ever read it since I wrote it, which is um, nearly 40, which is, it is 40 years ago. Um, and what struck me was um, its truth, that it is as real and relevant to today as it was back in 1981, when I sat down in October 1981, after the Springbok tour had ended, and asked myself the question, what on earth were we fighting for? And as it said in the little introduction to this, um, it just came at the end of a very long, um, difficult 10 years where we in Ngā Tamatoa were fighting on all fronts, all at once. We were doing stuff in education, you know, uh, we were, um, we, we, uh, we got legal aid here, you know, Pauline Kringer and I did the submissions that got legal aid here. We, um, we, were had, we had occupations at Raglan, um, at Bastion Point, at Afitu. Uh, we had the Land March. Um, we had just so many things happening, uh, you know, on the real front, trying, we were struggling to get things going and not really succeeding. And so, at, you know, by the end of the Springbok tour, when I had um, been um, accosted by a group of, of I thought they were young men, but I, I actually think now that they were um, off-duty red, red, um, uh, the red uh, police force that were leading out the police um, campaign against us, the uh, us protesters in 1981. I actually think it was them. Anyway, they they gave me a hell of a hiding outside my home, and um, I had my glasses smashed into my face and had. I uh, had a hell of a lot of pain. Like I really was in excruciating pain. I thought, God damn, there's got to be a better way than this. What are we on about? And, you know, are we focused enough? And so if you go back to um, 
those days before 1900, there was a mass movement of Māoridom. I mean, our, our fight to retain our land was the stuff of legends. You know, we, we defended our land and were involved in wars. Um, we had Raupatu, we had the Māori Land Court, we had um, so many things were happening that we formed our resistance. There was Kotahitanga, there was Kingitanga, and there were other other um, movements, you know, to Koti, Hirangi, and um, and it, it was really our people um, struggling against the might of uh, the British Empire and the businesses that came here to settle New Zealand and the weight of the settlers that that really overwhelmed us, you know, within 20 years of signing of the treaty, we were already a minority. That's how quick it was, you know, and uh, within 12 years of the treaty, we had um, the British Parliament pass the Act establishing the New Zealand Parliament. And so we really were on the back foot. And, you know, you put that together with disease and um, the loss of land and the trauma that our people experienced. And, you have a situation by whereby 1900, there are only 60,000 of us left. And we have been um, through the mill. You know, we've witnessed death, uh, destruction, and we've still got the um, flu to come, which is going to further savage our numbers. So that's the backdrop to the work that, um, that uh, you know, Ngata and Buck and Pomare uh, reformed us, these young, you know, young geniuses who thought, okay, let's try another tack. Let's try accommodation and see how that goes. So they went into parliament and in actual fact did a magnificent job of saving us. And their view was, let's just survive. Let's get through that. And, you know, they were successful, even though they were up against it. You know, just on an aside, um, you know, one thing that occurred to me when I was reading um, Māori Sovereignty yesterday was in 1900, I think I had it in my, so 1900, the uh, Public Health Act completely ignored Māoridom. There was nothing there for us at all. And then you fast forward to the COVID situation that we have our United Health Providers and Iwi have been working on um, together. And you say, goodness me, you know, what has, have things changed? However, from that period of accommodation, which I think ended with um, Ngata's price of citizenship, where you know he he um, invoked us to take part in the in the uh, World War II, um, and as he said, we must pay the price of citizenship. So that was like the final leg of accommodation was to say, let's become part of the New Zealand nation. Let's prove to the white settlers that we are part of them and that we will fight alongside of them. You know, we will fight for Britain. You know, and that, that's where it was. And then my generation, you know, was um, part of the generation that moved from that to now beginning to reassert the treaty, Te Tiriti o Waitangi. And, um, you know, we weren't alone. There was the, the um, uh, you know, Māori Women's Welfare League. For 15 years before Tamatoa did our, um, our what do you call it, um, submission, had been calling for Māori language to be taught in all schools. You had the New Zealand Māori Council was fighting on all fronts, trying to get a better deal for, for us. Um, and, you know, we, we I guess we, we were part of a, a move that was rejecting accommodation and saying, no, 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 we have to go back to te tiriti. And, um, you know, what had happened to te tiriti was that, well, as you know, we all know, Prendergast um, brought out his decision based on an American finding, which basically said that the treaty is a nullity. And up till then, they were saying, well, Māori ceded sovereignty. You know, Treaty of Waitangi, Māori ceded sovereignty, so all's well in the land. And, um, and, uh, and we were saying, well, no, 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 we didn't um, cede sovereignty, and your celebrations are fraudulent. And so that's when our Tamatō was established um, at the Young Māori Leadership Conference in, I think it was 1970, 1970 led by um, Rangi Walker and, and Titifai Harawera and the um, then Auckland District Māori Council, 
they they had a, a young a young leadership conference and at that conference as we all know Ngā Tamatoa formed and you know it was just serendipitous that I had ended a career that uh, where I was going to um, be on the operatic stage and I was at university at this time and it was that you know the timeliness sometimes in your life is is what matters and for me the time was that I went to university at that point and was part of Ngā Tamatoa, who was a university-based um, uh, group. And I would say that nearly all of us, if not all of us, were children of returned servicemen who had come back um, to find that I'm afraid um, Pākehā said to us, no, 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 no. You'd paid the price of citizenship, you didn't because you're not white. And so they came back to, you know, appalling treatment absolutely appalling in terms of being allocated um, land when they came back that all Māori land was gifted and then given out to Pākehā. The health services that they needed um, didn't appear. We struggled to get work for a period there uh, and you know th the promise was not of citizenship wasn't delivered to us and so my generation um, came along and we were inspired by two pieces of legislation which I must um, remember. Um, to tell you about. One was the 1953 Māori Affairs Advancement Act, and the other was the 1967 Māori Affairs Amendment Act. And both of those were aimed at Māori land. And the 67 um, Amendment Act was really a devastating um, piece of legislation because through that, um, Māori Dam lost 1.5 million hectares of land that we were taken compulsorily from the government and went into um, into uh, went to the government and to the Māori trustee. And, you know, I was part of that because my mother lost her lands. Even though she had a toehold, she was uh, devastated by the loss of each of those blocks of land where the government took her shares and her sister's shares. It impacted her and through her, me. And I felt, I felt her pain from that 67 Amendment Act. And so, you know, it's just a hop, skip and a jump forward to 1971, 70, and the Young Māori Leadership Conference. And there we were, um, we decided to go to Waitangi in 1971 and really object to the Crown taking its big ships up there and all the sailors in white and look, raising the flag and celebrating Waitangi. And our thing was, no, 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 the treaty is a fraud. We meant the celebration of the treaty is a fraud. We are not an egalitarian society. And, you know, I'll never forget that first year we went up. And, you know, very nervous, not knowing, you know, we hadn't actually been protesting before that. Springbok, uh, the Vietnam War was happening, but most of us hadn't taken part of that. So, you know, it was our first big event. Anyway, we went up and... And as I've said many times, so for you who have, who have heard the story before, just forgive me. But, you know, we were dressed in black and we walked around the perimeter as the um, all the commodores from the boats were up there looking magnificent and the sailors all there and the police. And then at one point, um, Hana Tehemara, the great Hana Tehemara, she bolted. And she, she ran from the group and she ran towards the, where they were putting up the flag to, to stop it. And it, it was a, you know, I'll never forget that moment because it changed my life. And I just vowed that I would never not bolt again. I would never be the one standing there to watch my comrade take the hit and do it for us. And so thereby followed, for me, 10 years of involvement, of hands-on involvement, of, you know, working as a young psychologist, of having many, many subs, um, suspensions, but managing to hold on to my job, because I was the only Māori psychologist in the country at that time, so I, I had some value uh, but it was, you know, quite stressful. And at the same time, working with my other, you know, the, our colleagues in the first wave of Ngā Tamatō, who was, you know, um, Sid Jackson and Hana and 
uh, Tota Etawera. I actually, um, I'm just leaning over here because I pulled out this photo <laughs> of my comrades and I in 1971. We're at Kawatis Marae and that's Tota, Tota Etawera and that's me down there. Anyway, it was, it was tumultuous, a tumultuous time that followed that. And then by the time we got to, you know, and I did get, I heard Mirana talking about Bastion Point, and I was sitting in the meeting house the day they came to take us out. And I, I love Mirana's film because I'm sitting there looking terrified. I am the Māori girl looking terrified. That is me. And, and the memory of that, you know, is there was just a lot of moments like that where, um, you know, we were at Raglan and, and things happened. Anyway, so by the time I went to Cuba in 1979, and again, um, events there changed my life um, because being with uh, the last surviving members of a, a Palestinian um, commando group whose job it was to hijack planes and, and to be with the last surviving uh, survivor of that team. I mean, the most amazing woman. She was just an ordinary mother who took on this job, a suicide mission really for her people. And uh, Rebecca Evans, Josie Killen and I went over and, and she changed our lives because we, we saw that what we were doing back here in New Zealand was really kid stuff. You know, we were marching and demonstrating and writing submissions, uh, but we didn't put ourselves too much at risk. You know what I mean? We were very careful. And then I think it did change us because when we came back, you know, I remember sitting on um, Josie Keelan's doorstep, sitting in the, sitting in the sun, with my two mates drinking wine and knowing that the Springbok tour was coming and thinking to ourselves, we've got to do something to turn the eyes of white New Zealand, of white liberal New Zealand, of the religious groups, those who care about um, humanity, to turn their eyes from South Africa to here in New Zealand. Because, you know, as Muldoon said, they are our kith and kin. To right there are kith and kin. And we had apartheid here, but because we didn't have the physical separation, um, because we, we were allowed to mingle with Pākehās, we were allowed to go to schools with them, it didn't look like apartheid. But in actual fact, it was a system in which all the rules were made to privilege white people and to ensure their success and to ensure that Māori were always at the bottom. And so that's what we did. And, you know, I don't have to go take you through that, but it was, you know, uh, it was what it was and something I don't know that we'll ever live through again, uh, but it was a turning point for us. And I ended, came out of it. I can remember um, someone telling me about Hone Haruwe had something like a hundred and something um, years. If he'd found guilty on all his charges it was over a hundred years, you'd go to prison. I was like, holy smoke, you know, was it that bad? And actually it was. And I, I had 12 charges of writer's destruction, right? And the penalties were seven years to 14 years. So I mean, that's like over 140 years if I'd been found guilty on them. And so it was in, that was the mood. That was the context of me sitting down one day with blinding headaches and pain as bloody glasses working its way out of my eye and, and wrote the first part of Māori sovereignty, which was, what, are, what is we on about? What is this? And remember, all of the treaty struggles had mainly happened before 1900. So we were another era. And so what we did was to bring back the treaty. We got, you know, through Matt Rata, the magnificent one and only Matt Rata, who, working with his prime minister at the time, managed to get the Waitangi um, Tribunal established after the land, uh, the Māori land march. And, you know, with that, we at least had, even though it wasn't retrospective, and you could only deal with new um, breaches of the treaty, nevertheless, it was a start and we recognised, and we recognised this at such. And, you know, we had some cause for optimism because um, 
Eddie Dury had um, just taken up the leadership of the Waitangi Tribunal and, of course, the, uh, was successful in his uh, pressure uh, to, to make the claims retrospective. But anyway, so that's when I sat down. So the book is, um, you know, it's, it's written like someone who's blinking annoyed and frustrated and in a lot of pain. And that's exactly um, how I was feeling. But uh, I don't know if because you, you're a bit young, <laughs> but you know, at the time it caused a stir, <laughs> as you can imagine, because people didn't talk about Maori sovereignty or rangatiratanga. It didn't. They didn't talk about New Zealand as Maori land, and Maori land should be come back to us. This is our land, um, and uh, you know, and that the this government's all wrong. You're in breach of the treaty. You don't own this land. You know, they're much like Russia coming, invading um, the Ukraine. That's how the British invaded us, um, waged war on us, and then settled us. But it doesn't alter the fundamental fact that Ukraine's land belonged to the Ukraine people, and this land belongs to Maoridom. And back in 1982, I think, when we published the first article, that was strong stuff. Now, for those of you who, um, you know, because it's really hard to get, so I'm going to uh, let Heather let you all know when I've got this in as an ebook, so you can go on and, and get it. But I just want to read you the um, first paragraph of it, because that sums it all up. Māori sovereignty is the Māori ability to determine our own destiny and to do so from the basis of our land and fisheries. In essence, Māori sovereignty seeks nothing less than the acknowledgement that New Zealand is Māori land and further seeks the return of that land. At its most conservative, it could be interpreted as the desire for a bicultural society, one in which Taha Māori receives an equal consideration with and equally determines the course of this country as Pākehā. Māori courtesy has allowed white supremacy and cultural imperialism to pass under the name of monoculturalism. In this country, monoculturalism is a euphemism for separate development and a cover for white hostility and hatred of things and people Māori. It prettily avoids the issue, which is that for 142 years, Māori people have been excluded from all power and all economic decision-making, even when it has concerned us directly. It prettily disguises the fact that the Māori in 1982 is still struggling to survive the devastatingly brutal attacks on our land, our culture, our language, and our identity. Now, the reason that I accepted um, Heather's invitation to take part today was because I thought it was timely to revisit the ideas in the book and to see how far we've progressed. And, you know, for those of you who haven't read it, read it because it is the truth and it is the truth of today. And the stuff that I mentioned in there, you know, talking about our education statistics, our health statistics, our imprisonment statistics, you know, day-to-day -day racism, that we experience, white hostility, the unpicking of every effort we make to uplift our people, to uplift our well-being, all gets unpicked. And I say this in the book, and it has certainly been my experience over the last 50 years. And you know, and after I wrote Māori Sovereignty. Um, the Kohanga Reo movement was launched actually in 1982, the same year at Ahui, and, and it just exploded. It just went like that, a voluntary movement of our families who said, yes, we want our children to learn our language and we're going to do it ourselves. And, and in the first few years, with no money, they got a, a little seeding grant from the uh, Department of Māori Affairs but it was just the will of our people that we will do it ourselves. Um, and in actual fact, I think if we carried on that way without government funding, 
we may have done a lot better because we got fund um, we got funding and then it went up there were about 500 kohanga like that and then the government decided we will move kohanga reo out of department of maori affairs and over to the ministry of education and we will make it subject to all of the structures of the early childhood education sector and that's what happened and within a year we dropped by half within a year the numbers of kohanga, half of them had closed. And we're only now, you know, 35 years later, rebuilding to the level we were at back when they made that change. And then, you know, always kohanga was underfunded. Then we started the Kurakopapa Māori movement. And I'm just going to use one example, education, to illustrate what I say. We, we make strides forward and then we get pushed back. Oh, hang on. Um, Nick, I haven't got a, a, a clock, but could you stop me at when we get to um, three o'clock? You've got three minutes. Holy smoke. Okay, better move on then. Well, just to say that when we started Kura, we went up and it, again, it just went exploded. And then remember Mallard was the Minister of Education at the time. He says, no more Kura will be funded. Once you hit 60, that's it, zoom. And then we had the Wānanga movement start, and we got, I think, three Wānanga through Aotearoa. And when Awanui Arangi started in 1992, government said, no more Wānanga, stop. And the three minor tribes, smaller tribes, got Wānanga. And then the biggest ones, like the North and Ngai Tahu and Kahunganu and Te Arawa, um, it all stopped. So, you know, I'm just saying, we, it, even when we seem to be making progress, we, we are pulled back. Now, I do want to leave some time for questions. So what I, I will say is I just want to reprise the key idea behind the book um, came to me. I read Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism, in which she traced the, um, the persecution of the Jewish people who were pushed from their lands, as you remember, in the diaspora and ended up having to settle throughout the world, throughout Europe. And then everywhere they went, they were subject to um, heavy oppressions. At times they were kicked out of countries and whatnot. And what she wrote about, and she said how, how oppression was maintained and how the sovereignty of the, uh, of, uh, the, the Jewish uh, people was, was never able to flourish was through three ideas. One was the idea, the idea of the superiority of the of the Europeans and the idea that they had every right to, um, you know, to oppress others and that, you know, take that forward to the doctrine of discovery and the papal doctrines, which say that they have a right to go overseas. And if they find a, a nation um, like ours, where the people there aren't Christian, then they have every right to kill those people. So justifying their, um, what they were doing, the economic drive by the idea. So the ideas are important. And for us, the main idea that is really important is that colonization is just, it was done fairly, and it stands, it should stand. And that uh, part of the reason why it should is because Māori Dim, when the settlers came here, were barbaric. We were savages, and they were civilized. And I wanted to begin the conversation and raise with you the issue that um, we need to debunk that because it's just a nonsense. Those ideas are lies. And the first port of call for all of us, for the academics, for those who work in the bureaucracy, for teachers, for any thinking Māori, is to really work at debunking the idea that of their superiority and actually reach back into the reality of our ancestors and the lives they live. So there's just four examples that I'll, I'll touch on because they really do show the genius of our ancestors. And the first, the first um, concept that they lived by and the one that ordered their life was whakapapa. And I always say, you know, to people when they say, what, what's your advice for me? What should I do? I say, honor your whakapapa. You just do that. Because when you think of whakapapa as the, 
past and the future. And you, that is your past and that is your future. That's you. And you are the living embodiment of your past, your tipuna, your ancestors, and your future, those who will come after you that come from your ancestral. And you are the living embodiment. And wherever you go, you carry your past and your future with you. And that idea that our people had of the responsibility of those who live in the present to bring their ancestors from the, the, uh, from the past and from the future into the present, that ability to collapse time into the present and to live it is pure genius. You know, and the fact that we can name our ancestors, you know, they've had writing for 10,000 years. And you wonder, in all that time, did no one think of writing down your ancestral line? A few did, but only a few of the conquerors, but most of them didn't. But our ancestors memorized it. They committed to memory their ancestry because they knew it was important. And through that ancestry, they connected us to the cosmos, to the environment, to the rivers, to the waters, to the lands, to the, every other person living in Aotearoa. So the fundamental purpose of Whakapapa is to connect us, to connect us to the past and the future, to ne connect us to the environment, to all living things and to the cosmos. And that connection is the Maori genius that we need to bring into contemporary um, world. And we must never lose sight of that because when you compare it to the Pākehā view, which is disconnection, you know, the Descartian view of the duality between um, the soul and the spirit and humanity, if you like, and the rest of everything. Everything else is just something, a commodity to be used and abused, to be disconnected from. Even people they're disconnected from. Nationhood is about disconnecting. And um, I think the power of whakapapa, we need to hold it there. And the second concept is rangatiratanga. And I just want to miss, I want to correct the view that rangatiratanga means chieftainship. Well, you know, I was taught that people become rangatira because you give them the mana. And mana isn't something you plonk on someone and they've got it forever. Mana can be given and taken away. And as the early commentator said, they never met a person who considered themselves a commoner. As far as our people were concerned, they were all rangatira. So I think the, the power of the Māori view is of the rangatiratanga of us all, about the right for everyone to have a say, of consensus, of, um, you know, that of where the power is shared, ownership is shared. Um, resources are shared rather than the Western way, which, um, you know, started about 5,000 years ago when the pharaohs uh, accumulated the wealth of the people into a, a handful. And then from their example, if you look at all of the big empires that come down and then go over to Britain, they took on that model, you know, after the Romans um, conquered the Celts and then the Vikings came and the Normans. And then they built their own, their own kingdoms where the wealth was all concentrated into the hands of a few who dominated by power, by military force, everyone else. Now, we didn't have that. I mean, of course, we did have wars. But before um, the muskets and whatnot, they were you know, largely symbolic. We did have war, but not like the terror that they've had over in Europe for 2,000 years of war. Um, and then the third one I want to raise is the role of, of the family, of the home, of the role of women and of children. And I don't have time to read you, but I will commend to you um, the article that Anne Simmons wrote in response to Alan Duff's um, uh, characterization of us as once were warriors. And what her article is entitled, Once Were Gentle Fathers. And I think if you read those commentators from 1800, 1812, 1817, 1820, 1830, and they talk about the gentleness of the men and the child raising um, that the men did, um, the staunchness of the woman, the role of mana wahine that we're now hearing in the claim. I, I think that is a beautiful thing that we need to recapture. 
And the fact that we've taken on Victorian models of anti-woman hatred is, doesn't mean to say we've got to stay there. But when the colonialists came here, you know, you could, you could basically beat a woman almost to death. You had to practically gouge your eyes out, like literally you had to gouge your eyes out before you could go to court. But um, abuse of women and children, that was the norm over in Britain. And they brought that practice here. And I think through the trauma of land loss and a whole lot of other things, uh, we've taken on that, uh, all of those um, things that, that accrue to people who live in poverty and who've come from that, that model. And finally, I just uh, I wanted to just say that one of the things we've got that we must never forget and we must hold on to is joy. You know, the Whare Tapa Whā, they had, there was a reason we had Whare Tapa Whā, because it was a place where you came together and you sang, you, you told stories, where everyone participated. Like it wasn't a performance where you had some people were performance and some were participants. No, no, no. Everyone participated. And it was their ability to find joy in one another that um, it, it still, when I was a girl, you know, being raised in Ohanimutu Pa, and I go to my sister's parties, and the joyfulness, even though they were drinking beer, the, the joy was actually in being together, of singing these songs together. And, you know, that, that's it. That's it, the joy of being together. And it's why we love kapahaka, because we just love being together. Actually, we just love being together. You know, that's it. That's why we have so many hui, I think, because I think we have a craving for one another's company. Um, and, and, you know, when you think of the trauma that our people have experienced, when you think of it, the fact that we can still find joy in one another to the extent that we do, that just tells you a lot about our ancestral heritage, the joyful heritage, the whare tapa whā, the modi that they've given to us that I think we've got to... Um, We've got to hold on to. Um, got a, Nick. Got a Donna, that was awesome and um, very informing. There's been a lot of questions. There's been a lot of um, statements. And I think just to resolve the issue of the lack of uh, body sovereignty out there at the moment, your book, there's been a suggestion that we turn it into an audio ebook. Wouldn't that, res oh, you yeah. would, what you could, and you could do the reading. So uh, the other part of, the, the fact that I get to be facilitator, I get to get the first question. And, and when I read the bit about the 14 year old who went against uh, their summer uh, jobs employer and, and asked why there was a gender pay gap, I wonder what created that 14 year old. Do you know I had, um, people might think I had the misfortune of getting rheumatic fever. But it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because what happened is that, um, one, I missed school for many, many years. I didn't go to school. And I was sent uh, because uh, and I was living in Ulster with my family. And, it, you know, it's very steamy here. And they thought that a drier climate like Tokumaru Bay uh, would benefit me. So I was sent up there to live with my father's eldest brother. And I didn't go to school because we only had a horse to get to the, you know, we only had one horse and you had to get miles away. So I didn't go to school, but I did join um, Auntie Moi Pewharangi's um, kapahaka group. And um, through her and through just sitting around and listening to the Kotahitanga meetings was Tommy Tamaro, who we know as Tom, T Tommy Blue and Auntie Sani, you know, all the stalwarts um, of the Kotahitanga movement were in Tokumaru Bay and in Rutoria. And this is what I heard. And, you know, and if you, as I say, you know, I was, I was, I grew up listening to Te Mātauranga o Te Pākeha e me whakātou he tinana tanga mō waira mō hatana ki a tūpātou ngā whakawākia kahara. You know, the, the evil of the Pākeha has been inspired by whom? Why, by Satan, of course. You know, wow. Well, and they were, um, you know, twinning our way songs. They were radical stuff. And I grew up, these were the party songs. These were the 10 guitars of the day. And I think it seeped into me. And those rangatira, you know, ngoi pēwharangi, they, they influenced me. And my own uncle, who was a member of Kotaitanga and who believed this stuff, you know, they, they lived it. And so I think when I did come back to school, 
I had an attitude, you know, some would say I had a bad attitude. I certainly had a bad attitude. And, you know, and because I hadn't been to school, they put me in the dummies class, you know, in the special education class, because I couldn't, you know, I couldn't do maths and I couldn't do a whole lot of things. But, you know, what I had done, because I had um, children's encyclopedia, I'd learned Greek, I learned Latin, I learned German, because I just read everything. I only had just 12 volumes, so that's what I did. And so I was like, on one hand quite kuare, and then on the other hand, I was quite well read, you know, and I could do things. So um, I developed a confidence in myself. And when, when I got called names, you know, when it was, I went to white schools and they were racist to me, I just had an inner being. And um, at 13, I went to St. Mary's Convent and I, I was taught singing because my mother thought I'd be a great opera singer because she'd heard Kerry sing once. So I, we went to Auckland for me to learn singing. And of course, I was. I mean, I was. I ended up as one of the six greatest um, contralto profundos in the world at a very young age. And that's because I actually believed I could do anything. And so all these Pākehās were struggling to be great. And every Māori I knew, from Kiri to Hana Tātana to myself to Lorette Gibb, we just sang and it just came out and we were world class. So I got this ad attitude, I'm superior. So don't you tell me you're inferior. And I think that was behind when I went to work at egg distributors and discovered that um, my mother was being paid, you know, almost 50% less than the man next to her. I thought this isn't right. And I yeah. thought I had no right, you know, to go and bail them up. Can't fight. <laughs> it's my that. advice. Don't go to school. Choice of don't go to school. Um, so there's a couple of questions here, oh, quite a few questions here. So I'm going to try and combine, try and get my clever hat on around Māori sovereignty and what you believe the greatest barriers are. But let's flip that also to be what are the aspirations for Māori sovereignty? I'll just deal with the barriers because I'm dealing with um, I'm dealing with one of them at the moment. But the greatest barrier, see, um, Hannah said there was it was the idea, it was the power, the power of enforcement, whether it's military or police, and then it was the power to um, manage uh, the colonized people through the bureaucracy, and that's what the Chinese developed was that ability. The reason they could keep this incredible empire together as one was because they developed a bureaucracy that uh, centralized could then trickle down all the orders and they could you know, maintain policies and evaluate, monitor, collect taxes and whatnot. And uh, it is this bureaucracy and it has made sure that in health, our health statistics are the same. So the idea is racism. The, the idea of racism is that we are inferior and that only Park has no, Park has no better. And we are too stupid to actually look after ourselves. That's the idea that we've tried to debunk and we've still failed to debunk. Because even when we get the Māori Health Authority going, um, another government will come in and they will do what they did to Kohanga and Kura. You know, a great idea and they would smash it down to this big. So that, you know, whānau ora, brilliant idea that should have gone like this to there, in fact, has gone from that to here. And yeah. the Māori Health Authority will do the same. And so it is the bureaucracy and we need to unpick it. We do have some uh, levers that Labour passed the Public Service Act 2020 and section 14 says that they must have regard to te tiriti o waitangi. And that's the first time, te tiriti o waitangi. That means our rangatiratanga must be taken advantage of. The Education and Training Act has section four, it's stronger, but te tiriti o waitangi must be given effect to. So they're there in bits and drabs and um, I think the courts will decide, uh, not the bureaucrats, um, how far they need to take that. But what we are saying is it means in the least co-design, in the point. least governance. And yeah. I think if we move to co-design and co-governance, we're actually going to get um, somewhere. But the, um, the constitutional review, constitutional change works. It certainly worked in Germany after World War II. I mean, it changed German society and we can we can get constitutional change that changed New Zealand society. And, you know, but when the hell we, it'll ever come, I have no idea, but we can actually get it by stealth, just by by um, enacting these little sections that they've now got in so much, so many of these um, acts. Kāpāi. So there's another... Oh, I forgot to say about the... Um, 
you know, what's what's on our side? You know, what have we got going for us? And because in sovereignty, I talk about one of the hardest things that happened is that so many Māori have become so parkerized that you can honestly you can put a slither of paper that they are to all intents and purposes. And I call it, you know, that movie Aliens, where um, where she she's lying on the bench and then this little alien pops out and turns its head around. It's that. That's what happens. The colonizer indoctrinates you so that you grow your own little alien within. And yes. our job has to be to grab hold of the alien and rip it out. But <laughs> some people are walking aliens. The whole body is an alien. You can't tell that there's no difference between them and a Pākehā. In fact, some Pākehās are more like Māori and have actually tamed the alien better than some Māori. And that's another big disadvantage we've got. But there are enough Māori who are walking around who got no alien at all. Like they have ripped that alien out and they are our aunts. And a lot of them come out of Kura and, and um, you know, Kura and Wānanga or they have, you know, taken on the rail early or they've just cleansed themselves and they are everywhere. I meet them all over the place. They're a joy to behold. And that's the answer moving forward. That's Kapoi. I totally agree. I'm trying to get rid of that little alien myself. So I'm just one. Uh, there's a question here. Uh, just wondering if you think the change to the um, the teaching of the New Zealand history in schools goes far enough, or will it be sanitised version of history? Uh, I tell you what, it's a start. Uh, you know, at my age, I look for progress, not perfection. And you, you have to just say, let's get going on this. And there is going to be a huge backlash. There will be. Um, boards of trustees, you know, will they will take a brilliant idea as sanitised a version as they're going to get. They will desanitize it and, and re-sanitise it because their sovereignty, their power, their, um, their, uh, the idea that, that a white parliamentarian society is the only one and that they should run it and that power must remain in the hands of Pākehā depends on the lie of our colonisation. It depends on them maintaining amnesia, forgetting all about uh, what they have done to us, the savagery that they uh, in, they enacted on our people and they don't want to be reminded of it. Well, too bad, because I see this as a way in, just as I see um, the goal of having, you know, um, 300 uh, kura as a way in, the goal of having every teacher, every child must learn Māori. We're going to get there. It's a way in. And it's, we, we're going to transform this country. The great news, oh my God, this is one good thing I found reading Māori Sovereignty, it was I talked about the British jingoism, the chauvinism of New Zealanders, how, you know, Muldoon said around my table, you know, being British means something, and how New Zealand was the first one off the ranks to go and out to the Falklands, can you believe? We went to fight in the Falklands for Britain to own the Falklands rather than Argentina. This is how, how brainwashed we are, that Britain's the be all and end all. And our, our the, the colonization of economy, we're still into blinking farming for heaven's sake. Have we got no brains? So, you know, all of that British jingoism, I think the British jingoism is a far less. And, you know, that Radio New Zealand and some parts, elements of Pākehā world are moving towards creating an identity that isn't in opposition to Māori. And that's a very good move. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. I've got probably uh, these. Oh, a couple of more questions here. Um, what role do Toei we have in bringing about the tr this transformation? Um, actually, I didn't used to like um, Parker's running treaty training and whatnot, um, but I'd rather them than us. Do you know what I mean? I've done anti-racism training for 10 years. It's exhausting and it's, it's soul-destroying. Uh, so I think their role is actually to lead out the partnership debate. That's their role, is actually to normalise te tiriti or waitangi among the Pākehā community in whatever way they can. And I think they need to mount a campaign. Don't just leave it to us. You know, we are a minority in this country and we are brutalised. <clears throat> if, if a Māori stands up 
And for those who don't believe me, that's because you haven't stood up enough. But you do it often enough and strongly enough, and you will get treated just the same as all the rest of us do. Smashed down and slammed down, and your families, they go after your families, um, and it is hard. You lose your jobs, you know, all of that that we've been through. Now, Pākehās have got so much privileges, and it's about time they started organising better to use them. And as groups, you know, we've had, uh, you know, Auckland Council on Racial Discrimination, they, they did a brilliant job back then, but there wasn't another generation to come and pick that up. And I, I think just like the Springbok tour, we were able to beat that drum and to collect the people together. And that's what uh, Pākehās need to do. They have got to get behind Te Tiriti o Waitangi, behind the need for constitutional change, behind the drive, get money and start taking cases to the court, judicial reviews on how these CEOs are trampling all over the, um, uh, the treat at Te Tiriti o Waitangi, uh, you know, um, obligations. And uh, just to say that um, in the climate arena where I've been working um, intensely for the last uh, three, four years, there is in the climate um, legislation, it says that they must give regard to Māori, to Te Tiriti o Waitangi. And of course, we then get the Climate Commission put something out, one token Māori sits there, and they get something that completely ignores all the submissions that Māori have made. It's though we never said a word, though we never existed. It's taken us back to 1900 and the Public Health Act, where Māori are missing. And when they pass the ETS, you know, again, Māori are missing from it. And they've got um, stuff coming down from Stuart Nash at the moment that is going to devastate the Māori economy. It is another land grab. It gives the power of decision making over our land to park our farmers and park our dominated councils. In 2022, and under a Labour government, this is this is where, you know, and we Māori are trying to fight this, and we're up against a wall of the Pākehā farmers that have just got mega millions to spend. And then there's us, our little Māori groups just struggling away on behalf of 27,000 Māori land blocks to, to bring out, to bring their concerns to government. So, you know, Pākehās, please, it's time to stand up maranga mai. Pai, I think we've got time for just one little last question, which is almost a subset of what we've just talked about. Um, that says, I'm a recent citizen Tangata Treaty from Pakistan. What role can people like us play to be useful ally for Tino Ranga Tiratanga for Tangata Whenua? <laughs> well, firstly, welcome. <laughs> and I'd say, jump in, boots and all. That's what I say. You just take that space. No one's going to give it to you. And we're all busy carving out our own space. So you simply have to make that space. But we are your allies. Uh, and, you know, I remember on um, when the Polynesian Panthers, what they always forget uh, to mention in the celebrations that they've had of their, of their 10th anniversary, of their 50th anniversary, is that initially they had Tekna Tamatoa. And they said that we should see ourselves as Polynesians and join the Polynesian struggle, that that was the primary struggle, not being Māori. Anyway, they've forgotten all of that because they went after the, um, you know, Stokey Carmichael and the Black Power Movement, whereas what we were following was our ancestral path that had been carved out um, for us. So we were on a different sort of thing. But I did want to just have one thing because, you know, I've got um, seven children who are in their own ways engaged in deconstructing the bureaucracy and in deconstructing colonization and in standing out against racist microaggressions, which is a wears you down after a while. And you know, and the thing I want to say to my children and to all our young people is go easy on yourself. You know, um, I got to where I am now because I love life and I enjoy life and I am a hedonist and I love good food and all my adult life I've loved, you know, good wine to the point now where husband and I have a, a fabulous wine company, you know, so be with people who uplift you, you know, if someone's giving you, um, if your husband or partner's giving you a bad time or if your wife's nagging you, get out of there, you're better off alone and go back to your whanau. Go easy on yourself. 
enjoy your life at this you can do both it doesn't have to be looking all grim and sad and you know always being dressed in black and thumping the table <laughs> you just oh. gotta you know, get a life enjoy enjoy you know and and make it a purpose be purposeful about it go find a partner who will support you you know go find great food learn how to cook and cook brilliant meals you know anyway lighten up people <laughs> Kilda, <laughs> and i just want to tell you we had 343 participants today listening to your port it all it's been an absolute pleasure to catch up again and keep doing the good thing and we look forward to mighty sovereignty revisited part two whatever yeah. that is and and how whakapapa rangatira tanga whānau and joy come into that so kia ora thank mm -hmm. you Donna. thank you thank you all you much, love. Um, much love much love